Welcome to another author talk at Google. Today we have Jim Leak. Jim is an accomplished journalist and writer of books, as well as um, a lot of marketing communications. He runs his own marketing company now. Um, Jim has been a journalist for about, what, 30 years, something like that? Many, many years. Something like that. Um, he started out as a tech writer here, I was actually a technology reporter here in Silicon Valley in the late 70s and early 80s. He also served as a sports writer in Chicago. He has written five books, I believe, including a marvelous uh, mystery novel, several books about the Civil War, and the book he'll be talking about today, which is the story of the planning behind the JFK funeral. Many people know all about, or think they know everything about, the assassination of John F. Kennedy, the, the mourning of the nation afterwards, but very little has been written, if any, about the remarkable planning and execution of the actual funeral that was watched by millions around the world and is still considered sort of the greatest state funeral in American history. So to tell you that story of how it came about and the sort of the evocative quality it still holds today, we have Jim Leake. Welcome, Jim. Thank you. Well, thanks for coming. I, I know there's a, a lot of competition here today, so I appreciate it. And uh, what Laura didn't tell you is that she also used to be my boss, so. She's still looking out for me, and I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, this, this was a hard book. It, was, it started out as a simple book. It was going to be almost a guidebook, and then it grew and took on greater dimension. And when you write a book, you write the book, you wait a long time, it comes out, you reread the book to remind yourself what, it, what was in there. And then you go talk, and you don't mind talking, because that's what you're supposed to do. Uh, but this time, that's not exactly how it worked out. You know, I did the book, I waited a long time, and then I knew I had to speak about it again. And this is, this is the first time, on the, the first event. And, and I admit to you honestly, for like the last week, 10 days, uh, this book has kept me up, um, thinking about it. Um, there's nothing I would rewrite about it, but when I browse back through it, it surprises me. Even though I know what's in there, uh, I look back at it and go, oh, oh, and here, and then that, and it, it was a remarkable event. It was a very remarkable event, um, which even when you read about it, it gets more remarkable as you think about it. Uh, that's, that's the best way I can, I can put it. Um, it seems like in every generation, there is a cataclysmic event early in that generation, when you're in your teens or your 20s. Uh, when I was a boy, I knew a very old man who was one of my teachers. He was my grandfather's age, probably. And the event he remembered was um, the Titanic, the loss of the Titanic. He remembered that very clearly. He remembered everything about it. And of course, he remembered it from newspapers and people talking. That was the, the medium of the day. And my parents' generation, they, of course, remembered Pearl Harbor. They remember everything about what they were doing when they heard about Pearl Harbor. And of course, they heard about that on the radio. And then, with most of you, uh, the cataclysmic event was 9-11. And you heard about that on TV and the internet and all of the many uh, mediums, the media now. Um, and for me, for my generation, uh, and I was a boy when this happened in 1963, I was in the eighth grade, the cataclysmic event was the assassination of JFK. And, you know, of course, I lived later through 9-11, and I tell you honestly that the, the effect, the shock, was almost exactly the same. That sounds terrible to say that the death of one man had the same shock as the death of 3,000 people. But that's literally true, uh, because that one man, of course, was the President of the United States. Now, the image of JFK today is much different than it was in 1963. We know so much more about him, of course. Some of it good, some of it not so good. In 1963, we didn't know so much about the presidents. 
Um, you might get the impression now that back then JFK and his family were universally loved. That's, that's just not correct. He was a president, he was a politician. He was as loved or disliked as any other president or any other politician. But unlike most, he was very young, he had this beautiful family, he was charismatic, he was eloquent, he gave better speeches than any president since Lincoln. Um, so even though he was you know, a politician, he was different. Uh, a lot of people equate uh, Barack Obama to him today, and, and I, I see that, that parallel. So when he died, suddenly, shockingly, senselessly, the shock was unbelievable. Um, and then immediately it spun off into the funeral. Now, the, the book is almost formal. I mean, in the book, I talk about JFK as the president. I talk about Jackie as Mrs. Kennedy. Because during those four days, it was almost as if they and everyone else had roles in a defined play. It's just the way it came about. So the, the book has a, a formal tone to it that I won't use here today because it just doesn't make sense to speaking to you one to one. But I have three quotations at the start that I think will begin to give you a feeling for those, for those four days. Uh, the first is from Charles Collingwood, who was one of the great CBS News reporters at the time. And, and the quote from him is, ceremony is man's built-in reaction to tragedy. The next one was from William Manchester, who wrote sort of the definitive book about the assassination, the death of a president. And uh, that quote is, up ahead, General Wheel heard, quote, only the drums, the terrible drums. And if you've seen film of the Kennedy assassination, you'll know what I mean. And I'll, I'll talk about that a little bit. And then the third one is from Mary McGrory, one of the great columnists from Washington at that time on the Washington Even, Evening Star. And she wrote very famously, and this, this line was repeated many times, many places, of John Fitzgerald Kennedy's funeral, it can be said he would have liked it. I think, I think all three of these quotations are exactly on. Um, so let me go through it just sort of chronologically. Uh, John Kennedy was killed in Dallas on a Friday afternoon. Uh, his death was announced by Walter Cronkite, among others, but most uh, memorably by Walter Cronkite at about 2.38 Washington time. And Everybody got the news the way they did with 9-11. People said, oh, God, did you hear? Turn on the radio, turn on the TV. And in official Washington, it happened just that exact same way. Um, I'll read you just a, a little bit here, just a little tiny bit. Most of Uniform Washington learned that shots had been fired at the president in Dallas at 1.30 Eastern Standard Time in the same way that civilians did. Someone heard a tourist news bulletin, rushed to tell someone else, and soon everyone was clustered around a radio or television set. Sergeant Robert Gill was a 21-year-old Marine from Cape Cod who was kitted in the White House Honor Guard for sounding so much like the Kennedys. Gill was packing for a weekend in New York City when Liberty was abruptly canceled. You're not going anywhere, he and his buddies were told. The president has been shot. Lieutenant Sam Byrd had marched in the president's inaugural parade in 1961 as a Citadel cadet. Although a conservative Kansas Republican, he felt an affinity for his commander in chief. Today, Byrd had worked a funeral at Arlington for an elderly colonel and returned to Fort Myer the tidy old post behind the cemetery. Like Gill, here he heard someone say the president had been shot. Oh, really, Bird replied. He took two steps before it registered. The who? And 
and I talk about a, a lieutenant named uh, Richard Lipsy, who was one of the aides for General Wheel, who was the commander of the uh, Military District of Washington, MDW, which is the Army troops in and around Washington. Um, Lipsy was driving to uh, meet the general when he heard it, and the general was in his quarters when he heard the news. He said, and they met at the general's front door. I was coming in as he was going out, Lipsy remembered. We went immediately back to our office and got on the phone with the White House, got on the phone with the Pentagon, got on the phone with everybody else. One of the people we all contacted was Paul C. Miller, MDW Chief of Ceremonies. Miller's Bible was a manual, state, official, and special military funeral policies and plans. On learning of the, pres of the president's death, Miller informed the White House that the military district of Washington would be ready for whatever was required. This was an optimistic, but ultimately accurate assessment. Now they had this manual. And they had detailed plans for all the other living ex-presidents. They had a plan for Herbert Hoover, who would, had been seriously ill in New York. In fact, they had rehearsed Hoover's funeral recently, which later sort of fed into some conspiracy theories. They had detailed plans for Harry Truman, if he died in Missouri. Um, they had detailed plans for Ike, for Dwight Eisenhower. They had detailed plans for Douglas MacArthur. All these have been detailed down to the last item. They had nothing for John Kennedy. He was a young man. There was nothing wrong with him. Uh, he was the embodiment of vigor, the words associated with JFK. So all they had was the basic manual, um, which really wasn't enough. So JFK has died in Dallas. They bring his body back aboard Air Force One. They give no thought whatever to putting it, the casket in the cargo hold, none whatever. So they rip out a row of seats and cut down part of a bulkhead to bring the casket onto the plane. And the plane heads back to Washington. And remarkably, it's completely unescorted. There are no fighter planes, no nothing. It's all alone flying back east into the darkness. And in Washington, military Washington starts scrambling. Now the, the, the funeral falls to the 3rd U.S. Infantry. It's uh, the oldest regiment in the U.S. Army. Um, you will recognize them. You've seen them uh, during other presidential and state funerals. You've seen them greeting dignitaries on the White House lawn. They wear these beautiful dress blue uniforms, which are not issued to troops. You have to buy them. The only regiment those blues are issued to are the old guard. Um, they serve the president. They guard the tomb of the unknowns. And they're also qualified infantrymen, all of them. There was a book and a movie about the, the old guard called Gardens of Stone. And in the book, there's a character who describes the, the outfit as the silliest goddamn unit in the, in the army. And if you're in it, you can easily think that, but uh, you know, it's a mistake. You can only think that if you're actually one of them. Uh, from the outside, you know, they're completely qualified. They drill and the, you know, exercise in the field. They're infantrymen, as tough and as hard as any infantryman. And at that time, of course, they were all men. Um, so this is gonna fall to the, to the third infantry to conduct the JFK funeral. And Lieutenant Sam Bird, who I mentioned, knows he's going to be involved. Well, in fact, he turns out he's assigned to head up the casket team. Uh, he gets orders to head to Andrews Air Force Base just outside Washington to greet the plane and escort the body off the plane. Um, but he's not the only one who get that, gets that order. There are other ceremonial units in Washington. And, um, when you greet a body, whether it's the president's or a soldier's or any uniformed person's, um, there's a team called body bearers. And all of the services have body bearers. So individually, with no orders really, all these teams converge on Andrews Air Force Base. And when uh, Bird gets out there with his team, General Wheel is on the scene. 
and wheel tells Bird to form a joint services uh, body bearer team, which he does as, the, as they're arriving. He's just picking people out. He's, he's okay, you're my, you know, this is the team. You're going to take it off the plane. You're going to take it from the plane to the, to the hearse. Uh, the plane comes in. I don't know whether you've seen films of it, but it's, it's an eerie, eerie scene. Um, there are like 3,000 people waiting for it, mostly service people and their families, because it's on an Air Force base. Uh, the, the plane reel, wheels up, cuts the engines under these harsh, harsh searchlights. Um, the Times of London called it a nightmare scene, and it was sort of like out of a nightmare, because it was so harshly lit, and everybody saw it, of course, on black and white television. It was like a Hitchcock film. And it comes out, and they, again, they're not prepared for it. They're really not prepared for it. They don't have a, a vehicle to take a president's body off of Air Force One. The only thing that they, because it's not in the cargo hold either, it's up in the passenger compartment. The only thing they have is this truck. It's a catering truck. It's like the trucks that they deliver meals to the planes, like at the airport. That's exactly what it is. Uh, you know, raises up on these legs. So they wheel out this catering truck, which is understandable, but it just doesn't fit at all. You know, it just does not fit at all. Uh, and, and Bird and his team, they go up and they, they get on Air Force One. And there's a, an Air Force general who was one of JFK's aides on the plane. And he had been just devastated. Um, he had exclaimed at one point in Dallas, or just after they'd taken off, I only have one president, and he's lying back there. And he stood his own death watch all by himself, he, back with the body. And when the Lieutenant Byrd and his team came, this general didn't want to surrender the body. The Irish Mafia, JFK's people, did not want to surrender the body. The general tells Lieutenant Byrd, Sam Byrd, you know, get out of my way. We're taking this body off. And, uh, you know, in fact, a sergeant is literally shoved aside. So the general and the civilians load the casket into this horrible truck. And then, um, almost unnoticed, Robert Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, had boarded the plane. And he was with Jackie. And they got off with the casket and all the other people in this truck. And it, they lower it to the ground, only it doesn't go down far enough. It only comes to butt yay high. So now the, the people literally have to hop off the truck, try to wrestle this casket. And these are you now 40, 50, 60 year old people. They're civilians with this, this one general who's 52. They cannot, you know, they just cannot manage it. This is, and it it's almost degenerates into farce. And someone, I think it's Sam Bird like ignores his orders and signals the body bearers who are down on the tarmac to help. All of a sudden in the films you see these, these uh, troops rush in to help the civilians and they steady the casket and they get into this, army, uh, this Navy ambulance to, to take it to uh, Bethesda, which, which is where they're gonna do the autopsy. So that's the, really the last time where things publicly bobble. And there's, a, there's a, a photo I had seen of the, the troops rushing in to you know, help get the casket into the, the uh, hearse. And there's Sam Bird at the top of his truck, the only symbol of efficiency and authority in the whole place. And he's saluting like this. You know, it's just beautiful. It's just beautiful. And that's sort of the guy Sam Bird was. So now the the hearse heads for Bethesda, the medical center there. Sam Bird and his people, his, he takes one of the joint services teams that he has assembled. They get on helicopters and they, they fly to Bethesda to meet the hearse. Well, word had come that the body, the president's body was gonna come in a helicopter. So they're flying over to land and they look down and uh, as General Wheel and his aide and Bird and his team and they see all these people who have converged on the hospital, thousands of them, civilians, you know, and they're, they're barely making way for the, for the helicopter, and Lipsy, the aide, is terrified that the, something's gonna come wrong with the helicopter and it's gonna fall and 
midst of all these people, and it should be horrifying. But they, they do land safely. The ambulance arrives with the body. There's some confusion because there's so many people. And it finally gets around, and they, they uh, unload the body. And Jackie and the Bobby go up into the tower at this enormous hospital. And they do a, an autopsy in, in the morgue there at the, at the hospital. And the joint, with the joint services casket team is like, they're sort of professionally outraged at how things have gone awry here. And they're truly outraged by the civilians and the press, especially the press. And they take great pride in making sure nobody gets through. I mean, they, they find one imposter doctor and get rid of him. Uh, they throw somebody literally through a door who's trying to get in. There are no pictures taken of JFK or his casket or anything having to do with uh, the, the scene at, at the hospital. Um, now, in, at the White House, the president's brother, or, uh, I'm sorry, brother-in-law, Sergeant Shriver, is the uh, Peace Corps director. And he has sort of, by default, become in charge at the White House. And it's odd. I mean, the man's name is Sergeant Shriver. It sounds like a rank. <laughs> but he's a civilian, and he's acting like a general and directing things. And um, at the hospital, Bobby says to Jackie, we have to start thinking about what to do. And as First Lady, she had helped put together a, a guidebook on Lincoln's funeral. And she says, it's all in the guidebook. That's all she says. This gets relayed back to Sergeant Shriver. And there's a story, and I thought it was apocryphal, but it turns out to be true. He sends historians down to the Library of Congress to look up research Lincoln's funeral. And they get there, and I talked to one of the, uh, emailed one of the people who did it, get to the Library of Congress, and they go back into the stacks. And um, the lights are on a timer. They can't turn on the lights at the Library of Congress. So they go through with flashlights, pulling down old newspapers and, and magazines and books. And that becomes the, the, the basis for the ceremonies at the White House. Now, the, the Lincoln catafalque, where they're going to place the casket, that's going to be needed at the Capitol. But there was another one recreated for the, the unknowns, the non unknown soldiers of Korea in World War II. And General Wheel orders that to be brought to the, to the White House, and that's assembled. And then they follow the other instructions from the Library of Congress to, for the draping and the lighting and the, where the casket was and all of that. And they even, Sergeant Shriver even sends someone to his house to take a cross down off of his bedroom wall and bring it into the, to the East Room. And they're done with the, the autopsy like at four in the morning, and they're bringing the body to the White House in this sort of small caravan. And Sergeant Shriver is sort of horrified to realize that there's no one to greet the, the uh, ambulance when it arrives. There, there's no, there are no troops to greet the president when he returns to his house. So he calls the Marine barracks. Well, the Marines, you know, they're Marines, always, you know, they're ready. Um, they, were, they were perplexed that they had never been called. Uh, so they took it upon themselves to be ready. They, have a, they had a silent drill team. And that drill team hit the rack that night with uh, the rifles drawn, their dress blues hanging at the foot of their beds and ready to go. So uh, like, uh, you know, it's like a quarter to four in the morning or something, a word comes down. And they are at, they're, they're at Eighth and I. They're called the Eighth and I Marines at the Marine Barracks. In 18 minutes, they're at the White House. They leap out of their racks. They grab their rifles and their uniforms. They finish dressing on the bus as they're racing across Washington. And they get there before the, um, the ambulance, and they meet it at the gate. And they slow march it up to the portico. And one of the memorable descriptions was the only, the only sound was the sound of their shoes on the, on the pavement. Um, there was such beautiful writing in the, in the newspapers and magazines. I, I try to quote a fair amount of it in, in the book. 
Um, so the the Marines, of Eighth and I, they were, you know, they're they're famous for that drill routine. But they entered the barracks legend by getting to the to the White House in 18 minutes, and ready to greet the president. So now, Bird is with the with the body, and they have to bring it into the to the White House. He's got six people with him. Um, usually, when they when they bury someone or escort a casket, it's from the caisson, you know, a few yards to the to the grave. Well, they have to go all the way from the portico down a long hallway to the east room. And at the hospital, they had changed caskets because. Uh, the unprofessionals, the non-professionals, had damaged the casket getting it on and off Air Force One, the original casket. So they switched caskets. And as they start to take it into the White House, Bird and his team realize this is the heaviest casket they have ever handled. It's like the estimated weight was 12 to 1,400 pounds. And you know, six guys, and they're holding it from the side. You try to, you try to carry 1,200 pounds, six people from the side, you know, with holding it on the handles. It's enormously difficult. And Bird was the officer in command, and the, um, the protocol was that the officer never touches the casket. You know, that's, that's the re responsibility of the troops. Well, they're struggling so badly that Bird steps up, takes the weight at the head himself, and, and carries, helps carry it into the White House. Uh, not according to protocol, but it was the right thing to do, and, and he did it. So they, they get it. They get it into the, to the White House at four in the morning. And that was the end of Friday. It was a terrible Friday. And I'm going to go way over time here. So but I got, I'm going to cut into your question and answer question, period. But please forgive me. So Saturday, Saturday, everyone starts to regain their equilibrium. Um, and Saturday, it rains. Friday had been like Indian summer. Saturday was this horrible, depressing, rainy day. Um, and his body is, John Kennedy's body is in the, the East Room. And all of official Washington comes at certain hours to uh, pay their respects. And that's pretty much all that happens officially um, on Saturday. But Saturday is also the day when they decide where they're going to bury him. Uh, initially, the thoughts were that they would take him home to New England. There was even, there was a destroyer, a Navy destroyer, ready to take his body home. And there was even a, one thought to create a crypt on the Boston Common. But uh, Robert McNamara, who was the Secretary of Defense, had other ideas. Now, I'm one of those people who has no fond regard for Robert McNamara. I have nothing, I have very little favorable to say about Robert McNamara. But on this day, Robert McNamara may have performed the best service of his life. He thought JFK should be buried at Arlington. So he went across in the rain to check the scene. And if you know Arlington, you know there's a beautiful mansion at the top, the Custis Lee Mansion. Robert E. Lee's home before the Civil War. Um, and uh, he, McNamara makes like four trips during the, the day trying to convince people. And on one of the trips, he meets a young uh, Park Service guide who said the president had been there like a year before. And the, the guide had explained the connections from the, to the Civil War. And JFK had gone out onto the, onto the lawn, but has this, this wonderful sweeping view back across the, the Potomac of, of downtown Washington. Uh, and JFK said, you know, I could stay here forever. So this, this guy repeats this to McNamara, who repeats it to Bobby and the others. And just decided that, yes, in fact, we're going to bury him here. This is, this is Saturday afternoon. <laughs> They're going to bury him Monday. So meanwhile, the, the, the troops are practicing getting ready, making plans. Everything is just on the fly. General Wheel at one point says to all of his aides, or the people helping, um, this is as close to combat as a lot of you are ever going to get. And he, he's right about the pressure. 
But he's wrong about the combat because you know, Vietnam is growing and a lot of those people are going to see combat. But he's absolutely right on about the pressure and having to perform under hugely difficult circumstances. So now the next day, Sunday, they take JFK up Pennsylvania Avenue to the Capitol where he's going to lay in state. Um, he's escorted by um, a company of sailors because of his Navy connection. He's covered, he's accompanied by um, Joint Services escort, uh, 24 people, including Green Berets, who um, Bobby had asked to be included. The Green Berets were sort of JFK's baby. He, he gave the, he, over, he overrode the, the Army and told the Green Berets, in fact, they could wear the Green Berets. You know, that was, that was what made them uh, and they sort of regarded him as their father or godfather. So they were part of the escort. And then the only music that was requested by the family was drums. So they had created, quickly created, this, this was not in place at all, a joint services drum corps of 24 drummers. The drums were muffled and draped. That is, to muffle the drum, you loosen the, the drum head. And they were draped in black cloth. And uh, at that time, there was no official drum cadence for a funeral. Uh, at Arlington, the drummers used whatever they wanted to use as the cadence. But the, the principal drummer, a guy named uh, Vincent Batista, he had used one at Arlington. And uh, uh, one of the officers from the US Army band remembered it. And he asked him to, to play it. So that's. That's what they chose, and it's now like the standard. It was a very simple little thing, um, and that incorporated a little roll. Uh, so they're marching up Pennsylvania Avenue, and the only sound is the sound of the caisson, uh, which the, the horse-drawn caisson, which the casket is mounted on, and these drums behind it. And the, and the sound of the drums, if you've heard it, you won't forget it. It's, uh, Boom, 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 over and over, all the way up. It sounds so simple, and in telling it, you don't get the effect of it. It was this, it wasn't like a sharp drum roll. It was this deep, hollow, somber sort of sound, and it reverberated. The, there were troops lined up all along the, the route to the, to the Capitol, and there was like 300,000 people. And it was so quiet that people could hear the traffic lights changing. They literally could hear the click of the traffic lights changing. And then the drums were advancing. Boom, 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 boom. They could feel it in their chest. And uh, I, I could say at any point, you know, people were breaking down or they were crying, and, and, the, and they were, but the troops were pretty much holding it together, but you know, with difficulty. And um, they go up to, to the Capitol. They take the body up the stairs. And those are enormous stairs, you know, the east, east wing, or the east stairs of, of the Capitol. Um, that bird at this point has added two more people to his team, but still, to get up, up all those steps, into the Capitol, um, they barely make it. And Bird is again supporting the casket at the head himself, which he's not supposed to do. And um, they get it up to the top. And one of the others <coughs> notices that the, the sergeant in command, a guy named Jim Felder, who was a very interesting character himself, they notice that his, his legs are just quivering by the time they get it up to the top. And they, they, they bring it into the, uh, into the rotunda. And they, they have a, a service there. And <clears throat> one of the things that many people remember later was that uh, Jackie brought her two kids, Caroline and John. It was called John John. John was like three. And uh, they had to take John out because he was getting restless. But Jackie and little Caroline went up to the casket and uh, knelt and prayed. And Jackie kissed the flag. But little Caroline reached up under the flag and like caressed the wood of the casket. And there were like 
people decorated for valor who couldn't watch this. You know, they just they just had to turn away. And and after that that brief ceremony, then it was open to the people to come in and, and pass through. And they were gonna, you know, close it off at, at midnight or something. But there were so many people that official of Washington literally couldn't believe it. And police had never seen so many people. Um, there was a congressman who at, and so they kept the, kept the Capitol open all night. There was a congressman who drove the line of people and he said it was nine miles long. Well, I can't believe it was nine miles long, but all of the estimates, all of the estimates say this thing was miles long, at least two miles long. Now, you know, like a quarter of a million people is what they estimated came through uh, overnight. So then the, that was Sunday. Monday was the funeral at Arlington. Only there was th three segments to it. Um, they brought the, uh, the casket back down out of the, the Capitol, put it on the case line, went to the White House. Um, that's where the family joined them. Then from the White House, they went to St. Matthew's, where the service was. And from St. Matthew's, they went to Arlington. So Sam, Sam Bird and his team had rehearsed all night to carry this enormous weight. And it was, they struggled with it all night. Uh, and, and they really were terrified. They really were. Um, but when they came to bring it down, they had no trouble with it at whatever, and none. Uh, one of the biographers said it was like the weight was just taken out of their hands. They brought it down the stairs, and they were so able to carry that enormous weight that the breeze ruffled the flag, and the two men in the front both freed a hand to smooth the flag back down. Um, so then they, the, the caisson went up to the White House. And you'll remember the beautiful horse, the riderless horse, which is the ancient military tradition. That horse's name was Black Jack, after John Pershing, General Pershing. But, but, but uh, ironically, that was also the, the nickname of Jackie's father, Black Jack Bouvier. And on Saturday, the horse had been skittish. On I'm, I'm sorry, on, on Sunday it had been skittish. On Monday, when they were burying the president, there were like a million people along the route. And this horse picked up, picked up the emotion or picked up something. This horse was almost uncontrollable. He was controlled by a 19-year-old uh, uh, private from Alabama who had never worked with horses until he was assigned to, to Black Jack. And this horse was so beautiful that when on... Um, Sunday, pa newspapers mistakenly reported that he was a, a thoroughbred stallion that had been given to Jackie by the president of Pakistan. Now this was a purely army horse, one of the last horses bought by the army remount system. Uh, but, and he was so beautiful, but he was so wild that they, they could barely control him. And all of that entered the, the mythology of, of the funeral, that uh, this beautiful imperial animal just prancing and, and feeling the emotion, which I think he was. So then they get to the White House where Jackie and the kids are waiting. And at this point, this is all, not impromptu, but it had been thrown together at the last minute at high speed, mostly at the suggestion of, of the family. Um, there are all these dignitaries from overseas the State Department had no intention of inviting them originally because the time was so short. And, they, and then they were flooded by cables from their ambassadors saying, you know, King so-and-so wants to come. Prince so-and-so wants to come. Charles de Gaulle said, I am coming because the people of France demand that I come. So they all came, princes and kings and presidents and prime ministers. And they were all waiting at the White House because Jackie was going to lead them on foot from the White House behind the, the caisson to the church, which is what she did. And um, not long before uh, the president died, the, uh, the Black Watch, the famous uh, British Army uh, bagpipe band, had performed at the White House, and she loved them. And they got part of the Black Watch back. 
and they joined at the White House. And they were, they were marching up to the, to the cathedral playing these wild, mournful tunes because she had asked them to. And then uh, Jackie and <clears throat> the president's brothers, uh, Ted and, and Bobby, flanked her. And they marched to this bagpipe because they behind the caisson up to the church. And you know, Bobby had been a seaman at the very end of World War II. Uh, Ted had no military experience. Certainly, Jackie didn't have any military experience. But you watch the film, and once they're marching, they're marching in step. And Jackie is leading them. And then all of the kings and queens and prime ministers and presidents are marching behind her. And they go up to the, to the, uh, to the cathedral. And then at the cathedral, uh, Cardinal Cushing, uh, uh, the cardinal for Boston, and the president's advisor, spiritual advisor, really, had married them. He's, uh, he's going to uh, conduct the, the funeral mass. And uh, he comes down the front steps of the cathedral to meet the, the casket. And, and the casket team was not prepared for this. So they're forced to stop in the street holding the president's casket while the, the cardinal is blessing it. And Sam Bird is about to say, Cardinal, you've got to get out of the way when uh, he finishes the, the prayer and they go on in. And it's a, I, I, I don't have time to, to tell you all of it. I wish I did. That's a beautiful service. And, and Cardinal Cushing is like, I don't know if you've ever seen film of him. He looks like God. He sounds like God. Uh, he, he does the, uh, the service in Latin. And then at the end, suddenly breaks into English. And then his brilliant extemporaneous farewell you know, speaks directly to, you know, you know, Godspeed, John. You know, I, I, I don't recall the exact words, but uh, it, it's completely moving. And then they come out. Of course, they bring the, the casket out. They put it back on the caissons for the march to Arlington. Um, and there are, there are two moments on the front steps with the children who are with Jackie. Um, Cardinal Cushing goes to Caroline, and he doesn't think she knows who he is, but he says, um, uh, Caroline, for your daddy, kiss me. And, and she does, and it shocks the cardinal. He's surprised. But in fact, she, she kisses the old man. And then the other moment is that... Um, Jackie leans down to John John, John Jr., who's three, and says, now's the time to say goodbye to his dad and to salute if he wants. So you've seen the picture millions of times. Little John in his little coat. He's three years old and gives this uh, perfect salute. And the, there are dozens of cameras that capture this. But there was a Monsignor who was involved in the service who was looking back across the street where all the people and the cameramen are. And he says, when John saluted, everybody across the street burst into tears. He said, that was the picture nobody captured, and that would have captured it better than any picture. But you've, you've seen the picture of John, and I've seen another picture of, from the side. And there's an old guard captain, ramrod straight, just perfect. And then there's little John, just a few yards away, perfectly doing it the same thing. And it just, just destroys people. You know, it just destroys them. Even some of the troops. There was one, somebody in the color guard who had to excuse himself and step back and take off his cap. He just, he, you know, they couldn't take it. So now they, they make the, uh, <coughs> the march to um, Arlington. And the, this whole route from the Capitol to the White House to the cathedral to, <coughs> to uh, um, the cemetery was like five miles. The Post called it a five-mile lane of sorrow. So they're marching to the cemetery. And uh, again, it's totally quiet. And one of the uh, body bearers, one of the escorts, told me that people were calling out as if John Kennedy were there, that, as if he were on that caisson. They would, sometimes they would just say his name, or sometimes they would say goodbye, or sometimes they would say, you know, we love you. And that was the only sound, except for the drums. Now only the drums were playing. So 
They march across to uh, Arlington, across the Memorial Bridge, into the, into the cemetery. And the, the grave has been dug there, below the, the mansion on the long slope. And all the cars um, from the church are trailing along behind. And they reach the cemetery. And now they've been marching a long way. Even the horses are tired, you know. Everybody's exhausted. And not, and, and you know, there was an, an enormous cortege that had accompanied this. I, it's, it's all detailed in the book. It's enormous. It's thousands of troops. And they get to the cemetery. And most of those peel off. And there's just a, a few small units that go into the cemetery. And... Um, now the, the body bearers, Sam Bird and his people, are taking the, the casket up, and they're, the clergy in front of them are slowing down, and they're marching up a hill across mats and grass, carrying this. They, they can barely do it. I mean, they're silently, like, under their breaths, urging each other on. You know, we've got to do this, we've got to do this. And um, somehow they do. And uh, the, the services at the cemetery are, are very... Um, Simple, and, and you know the, uh, the eternal flame that we all remember now. That was another impromptu, completely impromptu uh, detail. Uh, Jackie had remembered a flame in Paris and had asked on Sunday that to have one. So the Corps of Engineers devised this thing, this whole system, you know, in like 12 hours, and installed it and had it ready. So as, uh, uh, as the family reaches the gravesite, the flyover starts. It's 50 Navy and Air Force jet planes and flights of three. Uh, and, and they come over and they've been circling and they've come from as far away as Florida uh, for the flyover. 50 planes uh, going over in this enormous wash of noise at 2,500 feet at 400 miles an hour, 50 of them. Then the last, the last flight only has two, and that's the missing man formation. And then, you know, some of those pilots, very shortly afterwards, involved in the Vietnam War, which heats up later. And one of them, in fact, is shot down and held as a prisoner for a long time. And after the, the fighters go over, Air Force One comes in for this low, sweeping pass, this beautiful plane that the Kennedys had, had uh, uh, styled themselves, really. I mean, that, that familiar, beautiful uh, decor, that, that's from the Kennedy era. And that plane came over and it did the slow dipping of the wing and flew off. And there was an Air Force officer watching with his boy over, over across the river at the, by the Washington Monument. And when he saw Air Force One come over, he broke into tears, you know, it was just... So the, the service at the, at the grave site was simple. And at the end, um, an old guard officer handed Jackie uh, a lighted wine so that she could light the eternal flame. And uh, he said, this is the saddest moment of my life. And she lit the flame, and then she handed it the wine to the president's brothers, and they both touched it. And, and, and then it was over. Except she didn't just go home. She went back to the White House. Jackie Kennedy went back to the White House and greeted all those presidents and prime ministers and princes and queens because she thought that's what she should do. She thought, she thought that was her duty, and she did it. And uh, I guess if I changed my thinking about something as I did this book, it was about Mrs. Kennedy. I mean, I'd always had a good opinion of her, um, but as I put this together, I saw what enormous strength and dignity she had in, in those unimaginable circumstances. At a time or two, she was in tears or near tears, but for the most part, she's walking erect in, that, in a black suit behind a veil, and she's doing all of the right things. She doesn't make a wrong step anywhere. It's just one of the most magnificent things you've ever seen. And then the whole, the whole event, 
the whole event was like that. I mean, there was no planning on Friday. On Monday, there's this event that appears from the outside to be perfect. Um, even the mistakes seemed planned and perfect. When the bugler plays taps at the graveside, if you've ever heard taps played in earnest, as I have, it's enormously moving. Uh, there's nothing that drills through you more. But, and, and the bugler was almost an afterthought. In fact, they didn't call him up till 2 o'clock in the morning. They had just forgotten about the bugler. But this bugler was the principal bugler, bugler of, the, of the U.S. Army band. And he had been standing out there in the cold all day. And he was standing too near the firing party. And it was half deafened. And when he started to play taps, it's not, it's, taps is only 24 notes. And he gets to the sixth note, which rises slightly. And he can't hold the note. What they, they say he cracked the note. He lost that note. And this was the best bugler in the United States Army. And it was so beautifully, exquisitely timed. Some people thought he did it on purpose. It was as if all the emotion had come out. And it got to be eerie. Other buglers at Arlington later, when they would play, they would miss the same note, not on purpose. They'd miss the same note. And other buglers across the country actually missed the note on purpose because it sounded like that's where the emotion was just too much. And I, you know, he, the bugler couldn't bear it anymore. That really wasn't the case, but it sounded like it was the case. Even the mistakes were beautiful. So. The whole event, the whole Friday afternoon to Monday afternoon, ad hoc, people making decisions on the fly, going beyond what they could do, carrying caskets they can't carry, uh, making gestures spontaneously that just strike people as wonderful and horrible at the same time. The whole event is miraculous. That's what I've been thinking about the last week or so. The whole event is just miraculous. There's no way it should come out the way it did. And yet it did. Uh, I mean, if you're a religious person, you can find explanations. If you believe in fate and destiny, you can find explanations. If you believe in duty and basic human dignity, you can find explanations. Whatever explanation you find, it's still miraculous. It's just, uh, having finished the book, I'm now thinking about it. I'm awed by the, those four days in Washington. So no, I've taken my time, so thank you very much. If anybody have any, has any questions, I'd be glad to answer them. I actually did have one question. I just wanted to know what happened to um, the bird who's one pleasure. There were very sad uh, overtones to some of this. The bird, Sam Bird, who some of the body bearers called a soldier, soldier. He was just so much admired by the people he had assembled in that team. Sam Bird went to Vietnam and on his birthday was hit in the head, wounded in the head, almost exactly like John Kennedy was. And they airlifted him out. And the, the pilot who airlifted him out wondered why they put this dead man on his chopper. But he didn't die. He got home. He was semi-paralyzed, he was invalided out. He died of that wound 17 years later. And Senator Dole and various veterans groups got Sam Bird's name added to the wall in Washington. And then Sam Bird's commanding officer, a guy named Michael Groves, who was the honor guard company commander, who really had the, uh, the prime responsibility uh, for the old guard, for, the, for that team, he was under such enormous pressure. This was a young 27-year-old infantry captain. He died at his dinner table of a heart attack eight days after the funeral. That was the extent of, that was the measure of the pressure that those people were under. A young, vital infantry captain died of a heart attack a week after JFK died. So the story just went on and on and never really ended. So. But thank you.